Fridays for Liberty. We are a network for classically liberal and libertarian students all around the world. Our goal is to educate, develop, and empower the next generation of leaders of liberty. And if you want to join us, and if you are interested in such a um, in such a uh, campus activity, um, then you should uh, check out the website localcoordinators.org. Today's guest um, is um, a huge honor for us. Um, he has studied um, he has studied uh, electrical engineering at Caltech. Uh, later on, followed by a master's in economics and a, a PhD in economics um, at Harvard University, a uh, master's at Kansas University. Um, he was a professor at universities like University of Arizona, Purdue University, Brown University, the University of Massachusetts, and uh, George Mason, Mason University and right now serves as a professor of economics and law at Chapman University in California. Um, Dr. Vernon Smith, because uh, we are of course talking about uh, Dr. Vernon Smith has also been awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002 for his um, outstanding work in experimental economics and also a lot of other prizes, but if we start to name all of them, we won't have enough time for the interview. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you and also Bader uh, Zayden, I believe, for sort of executing uh, this idea. The idea comes from Tom Palmer, I believe, originally. So, uh, uh, yes, and thank you for welcoming me. So it is not that often that we interview a man who is a pioneer in his field. Um, you were, as I just uh, said, awarded the uh, Nobel Prize for your work in experimental economics. And um, I'm not an economist. I'm not a... Uh, economics student. I'm just a law student. And um, typically, when I think about laboratories, when I think about experiments, um, the economics department is not the first one I think about. I typically think about biology, chemistry. Um, and I wonder how an experiment looks like. What is experimental economics, in fact? Um, could you explain that for, for a person uh, sure. who's not in the context? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, economics tends to be taught in a fairly abstract way. And even, even the, the introductory class, uh, classes of economics are, uh, tend to emphasize uh, theory and, and, and of course the, the, the uh, commanding model in economics is supply and demand if, in terms of, of understanding the functioning of, of the ordinary day-to-day -day, uh, markets. Uh, well, when I finished my uh, PhD in 1955, uh, it was widely believed in the profession that supply and demand theory was kind of an abstract ideal and uh, and that it was uh, for example nothing nothing in supply and demand theory really was related to what people might do on the ground okay it was a, it was an abstract concept which actually you, you could you could for example, do exercises when we had the Arab cutoff of oil in the 1970s and then there were shortages, prices went up. So uh, narratives like that fit into the way people taught and shifted the supply and demand curves back and forth. 
Well, I went to Purdue in uh, January, or in, uh, I'm sorry, the fall of 1955, and, and, my, and I was teaching principles of economics there. And it sort of bothered me that I didn't know much about the connection between what I was teaching and kind of ordinary uh, experience of people and markets. And so I sort of resolved to, to do an experiment. I won't go into, I was, had been influenced by one of the Harvard professors in an experiment that he had done, but uh, I, it, his experiment, I thought, and generally the graduate students at Harvard agreed was, had, had a lot of, of, of deficiencies. So I thought, well, I will, the idea for doing an experiment, I thought is actually a good one and it's a, it would be a way to introduce people to, uh, to supply and demand theory. So, so I, did, I did an experiment. And let me explain now how, how this works. Uh, in my class, I had 11, I had 22 people in the class, okay? It was the first day. I thought I'd do this experiment before they had read anything in economics so to speak, before they were contaminated by any of the literature. Let me, let me see how they do without uh, any, any knowledge if we have put them in this experiment. Um, all right, now half the class I made sellers and I motivated them in the following way. A, a seller has an item for sale and it has a value to them if they keep it or you, if it's a if, if it's a production economy, you can think of that as a cost, okay? So uh, I give them, I give each person uh, their cost or value for a unit for retaining it. So for example, suppose uh, uh, that value is $4. Well, uh, the understanding is that they sell that item to somebody else in the room who's a buyer and get more than $4, they, I pay them the profit that they make. So you, you have a unit worth $4 if you don't sell it. If you sell it, say for $8, you get $8 minus four, you get a $4 profit. Okay, now, now completely symmetric with that, buyers also profit, although we don't normally think of buyers as profiting. Uh, but they do. And each buyer, I give a, uh, a, a willing, a, a, their maximum value of that item to them. That is, if they, re if they acquire this item, for example, uh, suppose that value is $10. $10. Uh, if, they buy, if they buy it for anything less than that, they profit. So, Here's something worth $10 to you if you acquire it. You buy it for $6 from some seller, you've just made $4. Well, every buyer profits in markets where he pays less than the most he'd be willing to pay. Okay, so the, it's, the principle here is it really applies to very much to, to uh, real buyers out there in the real world, even though we normally don't think of it that way. Okay, well now take those, costs I've assigned the sellers. I array those from lowest to highest, okay, in ascending order. That's what we mean by a supply schedule, a, plot, a supply curve in economics. Take all the buyers and, and they have assigned them different values. And these can be just random numbers, okay? Uh, and you just array them from highest to lowest. Well, that's what we mean by a demand schedule in economics. Okay, it, it, it's maximum willingness to pay on the part of buyers and minimum willingness to accept on the part of sellers. Sort of think of that, think of it that way. And anyone who's ever been to an auction, if you observe the, the, what happens, you have an antique book up for sale, say, and what do you observe? The, the, the bids start out low, they rise, 
And as the, as the bids rise, people drop out of the bidding. There's fewer and fewer involved in the bidding. And finally, there's only one last bidder and no one ups his bid price and the item is awarded to him. You have just seen a demand schedule, you see. So uh, th these are revealed everywhere, okay, in, in these uh, in circumstances like that. Uh, the, the airlines overbook, so they have to buy people's tickets back, okay? So they basically uh, run a similar kind of auction, at least in the US. And they, they now do it at the front desk uh, and more privately, but I've seen them in the past when they first started, they conducted the auction right on the airplane. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so they're raising the price in order to get them. They, you have to have three people get off. They offer $200, they get one. So they offer $300 and now they get three. So they pay all three $300 and they get off. Okay. And then the other people uh, come in. So th these happen all over the place and, and we get very clear indication that people behave as if they have these maximum willingnesses to pay uh, somehow in their heads or minimum willingness to accept uh, if, if they're uh, sellers. So, uh, so I, that was the way I induced the supply and demand. Okay, so how do they trade? Well, I did an oral outcry, two-sided auction. Buyers announce bids, sellers announce asks, and if, if, if a buyer accepts an asking price, you have a trade. If a seller accepts a bid price of some buyer, you have a trade. And so the, the, the trades are pairwise, and as people uh, trade, they drop out of the market, and then finally there's no one left, and, and, the, and the market uh, market closes. Well, to my astonishment, this very first experiment I did, I repeated it over time, maybe a half a dozen times, it converged to the competitive equilibrium. It converged to the intersection of the supply and demand schedule. Listen, you can't believe I was astonished because you see, I had come out of a very traditional kind of graduate education in those days. And let me tell you, no one was prepared to believe that some sophomores can walk in the room and you give them this instructions and they can find the equilibrium based entirely upon private information. Each individual only knew his, his or her own value or cost and there was no public information. And there's all sorts of, all sorts of theorems and economics, there are no trade theorems which say that unless there's public information, people won't trade because uh, anything you do might be taken advantage of on the other side. And so it's all, there's too much uncertainty. Well, of course, in, in fact, real people, they're curious and they will in fact put, they'll announce a bid or an ask even though uh, they rationally don't know how to optimize at this point. So um, it was a real lesson for me and actually got me hooked on experimental economics because uh, I did more of these experiments, published my uh, first paper in 1962. And the reaction in the profession was all over the place. Generally, the reaction was, well, this isn't really economics because economists don't do experiments. So that's where I learned, you see, that what, what economics is, is what economists do. <laughs> and, 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 well, and people said, well, what do sophomores know? Well, it turns out they knew quite a bit. Come on. And, and so, you see, I had the problem of kind of persuading uh, other people in the economics profession that this was not completely irrelevant. And, and to me, it was an incredible environment in which to learn. And I started to do experiments and, and all of my learning in those days was coming from what I learned by doing these different kinds of experiments with, with undergraduates in, the, in these classes. So that's how I, I got started and, and of course, I never would have imagined, you see, that this would have 
become a subfield in economics or be recognized by the Nobel Foundation. I wouldn't, couldn't possibly have imagined that. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought that to be likely even 20 years later. But, you know, miracles happen. I wonder how your um, earlier field of studies has impacted your your view on economics, because um, you started uh, you started out actually with electro electrical engineering, just as uh, as my father and my grandfather, by the way. Um, so it's a very different field. Um, how did you come actually to get interested to, to um, economics? And um, how did your studies of, um, I think, first physics, then you change your major to electrical engineering, um, has impacted your views on um, economics in comparison to your co-eds? Well, the, uh, the neat thing about the curriculum at Caltech when I was there is that of physics and electrical engineering were actually in the same division. There was a division of mathematics, physics, and electrical engineering. And so electrical engineering was really uh, physics courses until you were a senior. And uh, there was, I had a problem though. T to get the degree in physics, you had to take SMICE course. And boy, was that hard. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 he, he was, Famous, he, he had uh, uh, he had even even flunked people at that class who later became part of the of the Caltech uh, faculty. So he had an incredible reputation. Well, if I didn't take that class, I could I, I didn't need to do it to get the electrical engineering degree. So that's why I have an electrical engineering degree. <laughs> uh, yeah, we all know these it, professors. Yeah, that but. But it turned out that then, then I got, as a senior, I took a course uh, and at Caltech in those days, you didn't take the principal's class in economics until you were a senior. Okay, it was the first quarter of my senior, senior year. And I was fascinated by it. I, I didn't even imagine that such a field would exist. And, And I remember going to the library, Caltech library, and to see what, get some books on economics or look at them and see kind of what this, this was all about. And, and one of the first books I ran into was Paul Samuelson's Foundations of Economic Analysis. So I looked at that book and I said, well, this is just physics. <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> also read, uh, 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 Mises book had just just come out on human action and I looked at that and I thought well wait a bit this is really a lot different so anyway these were my initial uh, impressions and so I I finished my uh, degree at Caltech and decided to go back to uh, Kansas and to the University of Kansas where I had very low tuition and because uh, uh, My family wasn't well enough off to continue the uh, uh, t t at, at the level that uh, I was paying at Caltech. And then later, and then at Kansas, I got scholarship support. And then when after went on to Harvard, I was a I was self-supporting, so I uh, I, I re relieved the financial burden on my my uh, my family through uh, either work or. Uh, or a scholarship of one form uh, or another. So, <clears throat> but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't change anything. I'm really, uh, if I had to do all over again, I would have got my undergraduate degree exactly the way I did and then done economics. So, and, and actually the way experimental economics developed turned out that my engineering training came back in because in uh, if you fast forward now up to the 1980s uh, and you see this is 25 years you see after I did my uh, first experiment 25 to 30 years uh, we're starting to get into all kinds of applications 
and 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 applications where the 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 interest is in how to design the market. How do you design a market in areas where people have never never had a market before? And we first did that. Uh, we had uh, support from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to. They were interested in deregulating the gas markets and, and pipelines where they were competitive, see how far they could go with that. So we started to do experiments in, uh, in, in uh, gas pipelines. I mean, pipelines connect uh, the uh, gas fields uh, uh, to remote uh, city gates to deliver the gas, you see. And typically there's more than one route that the gas can take from, from one source into a city gate. So the question was, suppose you just made, suppose that was completely competitive and uh, how, how well would it work? And what would be the, uh, uh, where, where might some inefficiencies uh, come in? Well, that exercise turned it out to be very, uh, very revealing. And, and indeed there was, you could show that, that there was pl plenty of potential competition already uh, built in the industry, although never been allowed to operate. So we, the experiments we did helped to inform uh, FERC in their program to, and, and they completely deregulated wellhead gas you see, and also where pipeline connections were evident and there were alternative ways to get gas transported, they were able to rely less on the regulatory aspects of pipelines and more on the market. Uh, and then the, the, I mean, soon thereafter, we got interested in, in electric power. And wow, nobody believed you could trade electric power with markets. Everyone thought that had to be uh, owned by governments or by or regulated by the states, as as in the United States. But but that started to come apart uh, in world markets. Uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, moved to denationalize a number of industries, including electric power. And why was that? Well, because interestingly, the British treasury was hurting. That was her, her main argument for it. This was costly and let's get rid of this stuff. And, <clears throat> and the same thing, Australia, New Zealand, uh, a lot of places around the, uh, Chile started to move toward uh, more competitive electric power markets. And we were, my uh, colleague, Steve Brissani and I, and Steve was a systems engineer with a minor in economics. So we both had, had engineering background. We were invited to uh, Australia by some of the distribution utilities, particularly the commercial and industrial customers of those distribution utilities were interested in uh, whether they could uh, restructure those industries in Australia to be more competitive because they felt they were paying too much for electric power. And also Australia produces a lot of energy intensive industries, industries that use a lot of, a lot of energy. It's an important part of their costs. And here they are exporting it and trying to compete in world markets. So it was an important, really an important uh, uh, public policy as well as uh, uh, issue for, for private industry. So uh, the neat thing about Australia, we had all these people that were telling us you couldn't, uh, this was impractical to, uh, to organize uh, the industry around markets. So we just put them, we had an experiment. It was a simple three node uh, representation of a power system, actually pretty similar to the UK. Okay, we had a main demand center uh, in the middle, 
and then uh, smaller demand centers to the north and the south, uh, most generation to the north, some generation to the south. It, you could represent that a kind of a cartoon version, you see, of the UK uh, electric power network is just a three node, uh, three node network. And, and so we had people pricing transmission as well as generation and also bidding to have uh, electric power delivered uh, to, uh, to, these are wholesale uh, buyers bidding to, to get the power out of the network that they can resell to their, to their uh, customers. Uh, so in Australia, we put people in this experiment and of course they, they did just great. They produced a very competitive market. So we had to ask them, well, okay, what's wrong with the experiment? You didn't have any trouble finding the, well, it just broke the ice, you see. No one, no, you can't make up the facts because there they were, uh, the participants had seen it. And so we moved from there and the Australians wanted to do, do a, a, a really grandiose experiment in the lab. They wanted to re reproduce their grid on computers in a laboratory environment take all the real generators out there and distribute their ownership among, or among a, a number of different producing sellers, uh, take the wholesale demand nodes and put, uh, it was a four node network, it would be when it was fully developed. And so we had four main wholesale buyers of power competing for that. And, and so they traded power and, and a, in a, an environment was a, which was exactly represented what a market would be in that state. And so the neat thing about it, they got a lot of experience with this. When they were ready to start trading power, they just moved the people in, in, right out into the real world. And, and it was very, uh, except for the simulation of the demand, they now have real demand, and of course, simulations that were being done were his, of historical patterns of demand in Australia, but it was just very, uh, re very real life. So, so what do sophomores know? Well, enough to get, uh, get a, uh, uh, something started that had, uh, an, in, had an incredible amount of life and, and people in industry and government got eventually interested in how these tools could be applied out there in the world and create new markets. I know that you don't really like labels, um, but uh, from what I read in your articles, from uh, what I read in your autobiography, um, you seem to be um, a person with um, classically liberal views um, with views that tend towards free markets and um, towards uh, deregulation and privatization. Um, but I know that uh, these actually aren't um, the roots of, um, of your family. In fact, you come from a family um, which um, is rooted in the um, workers movement in the socialist uh, movement um would you um elaborate um how uh, those views shaped you and when when you actually changed your views to um those economically um libertarian views well yes i was brought up in a, uh, a socialist family my uh mother's father had been an, uh, was an engineer on the Missouri Pacific Railroad. His twin brother was a engineer on the Santa Fe Railroad. Their brother-in-law was on the Rock Island Road. So it was, it was a, a family of railroad people and they all immensely admired uh, Eugene Victor Debs. Debs had organized the railroad workers in the uh, back in the 1890s, and there was a there was a big strike in 1998 that had been the breakthrough that uh, that got the 
uh, the, the railroad unions uh, recognized. So, uh, you know, in my family, he was Gene Debs. It was like he was a, uh, he was a neighbor or a member of the family, you know, everybody loved him. And, and he was also a, uh, a war protester. And uh, I don't think people realize the extent to which the First World War, there was an indigenous American protest to our involvement in that war. Uh, estimates of 10, 15% of no-shows for draft, okay? All kinds of people protesting the First World War uh, draft. And uh, at, at the time that the war ended, there were thousands of cases pending in the courts of people charged with violation of the Sedition Act, Alien Sedition Act, the Sedition Acts. There were two acts uh, that had been passed. Uh, one was so onerous. I, I mean, uh, it, it really totally squelched any kind of criticism of the war or, or any, any public speaking of any kind in opposition to the war. You could be arrested. And there were thousands of those cases pending when the war ended. Uh, and uh, Gene Debs had gave a kind of, kind of what you would call a generic socialist uh, anti-war speech three months after we had gotten the end of the, had uh, just entered the First World War. And he was very careful not to mention that war or even mention the current uh, uh, administration. Uh, in spite of that, he was arrested, uh, jailed. He, had a, he received a 10 year sentence. Uh, that case was bumped all the way to the Supreme Court and Debs and his followers got a negative decision on that from the Supreme Court. Uh, that gives you an idea of the tenor of the times. Well, after the war ended, the new president came in as a Republican president, freed Debs and a bunch of other people who had been arrested and put in jail because the whole attitude changed. People now, three years later are looking back with revulsion of, of the carnage of the First World War. So these protesters be, became sort of heroes. <laughs> and, and so my mother who turned uh, 21 and had the right to vote for the first time in that 1920 election, she very proudly voted for Eugene Victor Debs who ran for president from his jail cell, you see, and he commanded almost a million votes, which will give you kind of an idea of the, of the extent of that protest movement. So I was brought up in that uh, environment. And one of the things though that, that was, I think, really important about the American socialists was that they were really very devoted to constitutional freedom, to the Bill of Rights. And for example, Norman Thomas, who took over the Socialist Party after De Debs died, he took over that in 1928. He was six times candidate for president on the American Socialist ticket. He founded the American Civil Liberties Union in the 1920s. Uh, he founded the Fellowship of Reconciliation a pacifist uh, organization, or, or I don't think, he, I'm not sure he founded, but he was very active in it. And in fact, he broke with the American Civil Liber Liberties Union in 1943 because of Roosevelt's order to, in, to inter 110,000 Japanese Americans. The, the, the ACLU had went along with that. And, and Thomas was outraged <laughs> that they'd done that. And uh, he didn't actually resign. His friends uh, 
persuaded him to stay in the movement and, and to fight for uh, in defense of some of the Japanese who were inter interred on the West Coast. And indeed, he t had an important part in, in defending uh, some of those uh, cases. And that's all, you, that's all part of the Norman Thomas ar archive. You can, you can look that up. It was always a mystery to me later with American socialists devoted to civil and political freedom, why they couldn't get it straight in economics. Um, but that's, uh, that's one of those bizarre sort of things. I, I started to change after, but not much until after I started to study economics. And that began to change me and move me kind of away from from that original uh, socialist uh, orientation. But you know what really did it was the experiments. You see, there was no, that wiped away all vestige of, of this, this legacy, this emotional attachment I had to uh, those early roots. And you know, it's, this is not an unusual sort of experience. Uh, Frederick Hayek was a socialist as a, as a young man. And, and, and then um, when he got an education, he realized it didn't work. And so same thing with me and, and a lot of people, I mean, young people are, are, are pretty naturally, I think, attracted to the kind of ideals that are expressed in socialism. They're, they're kind of family ideals. They're still close to their family. Uh, and, and it's very important to have for people to study economics and markets and learn to, the real reasons why almost all of us are better off than our parents and our grandparents. It's, you know, it's because of freedom, it's because of markets, and it's because the, of the creation of wealth that's, that's produced by that freedom and those, those markets. And the neat thing about experiments is they enable you to, to really examine up close uh, a, a lot of propositions that come out of that way of, of, of thinking about economics and markets. So um, there is a question uh, from an attendee which I wanted to ask um, anyway. So you were born uh, in the year 27 and uh, which is of course um, shortly before the great uh, depression started um, and uh, as many families in the USA your family was affected as well um, could you um, tell us something about uh, yes yes my father was a machinist and he worked for uh, him a oil field equipment company in Wichita. And he'd come from a family of people that worked in the oil industry, just as my other side of my family was railroad. Uh, his father had been a tool dresser in the Pennsylvania oil fields. And, uh, and when there were new strikes in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then Riverton, Wyoming, and eventually El Dorado, Kansas, my grandfather, Smith, uh, moved to those areas. And so that's, and my, my father never, he, he wanted a more stable life. So he, did, he, he, he didn't work directly in oil drilling, but he, he, after he got out of the First World War, he uh, apprenticed in Cleveland in the uh, machine tool industry and then worked, went to work in Wichita in that area. Well, he was laid off, you see. So I was born in 1927. And uh, to give you some perspective, Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs in 1927, okay? Uh, also, it was the 200th anniversary of Newton's death. Newton died in uh, 1727. Uh, that's 
five years after Adam Smith was born, to give you some, kind of some, to, to get you oriented here. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, I, I later learned what a towering figure, of course, uh, Isaac Newton ha had been. And, and incidentally, speaking, uh, we're, I think we're, we want to, you wanted to talk a little bit about the current crisis. So let me, in the context of Isaac Newton, mention that you see uh, London had a terrible plague in the 18th century. Uh, in, in the 1700s, uh, Isaac Newton left London and uh, for 18 months, isolated himself for 18 months. And uh, he, he produced Principia Mathematica. I mean, probably the, the, the greatest scientific publication, certainly of that century and maybe of all time. Uh, so, uh, so some good can come out of crises. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, yes, I was uh, um, born uh, three years before, uh, well, two years, it started down in 20, actually 2930. In 1932, my father was laid off and, and we had a farm. And the reason why we had a farm was my mother's first husband had been a fireman on the Santa Fe Railroad and had been killed in 1918. So my mother was widowed in 1918 with two, two young girls. Uh, several years later, she married my father, uh, and I'm the only issue from from uh, that marriage. Uh, my, my mother actually didn't intend to have any more children, but my father was such a good father to these these uh, two daughters that, <clears throat> and my father thought the greatest thing that ever happened to him was to find a widow and two girls. <laughs> Mary. So, so she decided to have another child, and that was me. And, and I'm very grateful to her. Okay. So, but anyway, we uh, my father was laid off in 1932, and we moved to this farm, and which had been uh, the result of a uh, an insurance settlement because of my uh, mother's first husband's uh, uh, railroad accident death. Uh, and, and we lived there for almost two years, and it was an incredible experience for me. It was hard times for my parents, but, but to me, it was, uh, I, I didn't, and, and by the way, isolated, I didn't have friends. The nearest house, the nearest house would be, oh, a couple of miles away. Uh, so these are 160 acre farms. Uh, and I went to a one-room schoolhouse. You know, you walk to walk to school and you walked home. The kids all uh, you walked every, everywhere. And and so uh, I had an incredible one-room uh, schoolhouse experience, first grade. And there's eight grades in that class. And the my teacher is Mr. Hamburger, a local farmer. Uh, it was a German community, by the way. Uh, there had been a, a, a uh, immigration from Germany under uh, Bismarck, a lot of Americans, and, 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 and a lot of them were pacifists, objection. They, were, they objected to German militarism and, and left in that period, and I'm sure the hamburgers were part of that, although I never knew that for sure, but they settled in farms in Kansas and Texas and Iowa and lots of other other places. So my uh, teacher in that one-room schoolhouse, Mr. Hamburger, had the distinction of being able to uh, read and write English. So naturally, he's the teacher. They'll make him the teacher. And, and of course, he knew mathematics, arithmetic, and this sort of thing. 
what else did you need to know? Okay, in those days, uh, it was just reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's what you studied. And uh, no homework. I mean, uh, all if, if a teacher wants a revolt, you send farm kids home with homework. In those days, no, they uh, the the family had homework for the kids, <laughs> and, and was helping with milking the cows and carrying water and feeding the hogs and all kinds of uh, details like that. So there was no school homework. But anyway, that stuck with me. I always in that experience of being in a class, you see, and Mr. Hamburger, Hamburger would, he'd start in the first row, which was the first grade every day. And he, and he would, we would recite, he'd have various questions and he would leave us some, with some reading and then go to the second row. And that was the second grade. And so you learned what was happening in the higher grades. And at the end of the year, Mr. Hamburger sent my mother a note, said, Dear Mrs. Smith, Vernon can read the second grade reader. So next year he goes in the third grade. There's no need for him to take the second grade, he'll just skip it. <laughs> so this, this was the original progressive system in, in the American farms, okay. Well, by then it was time to move back to the city. My father had been reemployed there and uh, so I went back to the city and, and they didn't put me a full year ahead, but they put me a, a, a one semester ahead. So thenceforth, I was always the youngest in my class, okay? And, uh, and, and the problem in that, and when you go to high school and, and you're interested in girls, of course, as boys are naturally, that's handicapping to be the, very handicapping to be the, lower, uh, the youngest in your class. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Also, young looking. That 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 is true. Um, so um, there is another question from uh, the audience, which um, which I think uh, resulted from from um, your um, answer um, when you were elaborating about um, Australia and uh, the different and the experiments there. Um, the question is, which industries, if uh, they would get deregulated today, would um, reap the most efficiencies? Um, and um, more importantly, um, are there any industries outside the classic public goods um, that might potentially be more efficient with more regulated markets? Well, uh, I would say the prominent one, at least in the United States, uh, is still the one that badly needs uh, more deregulation is electric power. Now that has substantially taken place at the wholesale level. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission going clear back, uh, oh, in the late 70s, freed up the, uh, the interstate grid so the, the wholesale grid, the high voltage grid is uh, very much open to entry and exit and, and more competitive uh, pricing. The problem is in the United States is we have all of these states that regulate the uh, local distribution utilities. Uh, but there's no reason there might still be a reason to regulate the wires, but not the energy. Okay, and the same thing in, in local distribution of gas. Uh, you might still regulate the pipes, but there's no reason to regulate the commodity. In, a, in Atlanta, uh, in Georgia, uh, competing uh, gas producers uh, that they compete for your account to deliver gas to your home. And if they get that account, then they can just meter your how much gas you take out of the system and they, they just be sure they put that same amount in. So the gas is all mingled in a common pool in the pipes, okay. 
but anyone who's uh, delivering to some customer needs only to meter the, what's coming out and meter what that per, uh, company puts in. So there's no, no reason at all to, and the same thing in electric power, okay? There's no reason why competing producers can't supply the, uh, the energy to individual uh, uh, customers at the local level. It's just all a matter of meter, metering. Uh, but the, that's slow to move. In, in the United States, the one state that is kind of closest to that, a, a complete deregulation down to the retail level would be Texas. Uh, and, and, but, but Texas has been an innovator. You see, they, they had, uh, free pricing of gas, even under the old regulated uh, gas uh, Federal Power Commission, because they didn't, uh, they didn't export the gas, okay? They, they retained it within, uh, within uh, Texas. Same thing with electric power. Uh, the Texas grid has uh, only a couple of weak connections. That may have, this, some of these things may have changed since I've last in bulk, intensively been studying it, but the time I was studying, they only had, their grid only had a couple of weak connections with the rest of the world. And so uh, Texas was in a position to follow pretty much, uh, I mean, different policies than were followed by, by uh, other states. So now how far could, uh, well, I think, <clears throat> see that the internet just, and, and we've seen that in the development of the, of the, uh, the, the media uh, internet companies uh, makes it possible to have just a, a whole lot more uh, co competitive connections between uh, the uh, producers of goods and services and the, and the con consumers of those goods and services. And we're starting to see now uh, in the case, take Uber and, and Lyft, these uh, 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 transport, the, the transportation of of by car of decentralized uh, uh, passengers. We now have the, the technology to e easily match buyers and sellers, you see through the uh, communication system, we can match them in real time and space in terms of their uh, particular characteristics and match buyers and sellers, okay? And, and so that's, that's an incredible, uh, has incredible possibilities you see all over the world for, for, uh, for changing how those, all of those businesses are run. And, and right now we have Uber and Lyft are making possible the far more efficient use of automobiles. There's all kinds of automobiles that are idle, okay, on Saturday and Sunday, and guess what? The husband is home, the wife is out on the road, uh, and she's working for Uber or Lyft or one of these. In fact, I had I, I ran into one right here in Orange. She she stopped me and she asked me if she wanted to know if it was a, that if you got tickets for turning right at that at that last intersection and I said I don't know whether they're enforcing that or not and so she went on and explained she said well if I get a ticket it wipes out my earnings today I drive uh, I drive our car on weekends when my husband is home well that gives you an example you see so you've got uh, 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 all kinds of machinery and equipment that would otherwise be idle has the possibility for being uh, utilized more efficiently and effectively with this kind of of technology.
Okay, thank you for for uh, being here with us tonight. Unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to cover all the topics I wanted to cover. Uh, but uh, thank you for your uh, for your answers. Thank you for taking the invitation. Um, I also want to thank uh, everyone who uh, was a viewer. I want to thank for the questions. Um, and I want to um, wish you and uh, your wife um, a very good time um, and uh, wish you health in those um, scary times uh, for all of us because um, health in the end is the most important thing. Um, and um, I hope uh, to interview you again in the future. Okay, Adam, and thank you very much.